Hello and welcome to the Meta Hour podcast with Sharon Salzberg. I'm Lily Cushman. I produce this podcast and we're coming to you today with a special episode 226 in celebration of the launch of Sharon's new book, Finding Your Way, which dropped October 10th in hardcover and ebook formats. And today's episode is actually from someone else's podcast, and that is 10% Happier, hosted by the wonderful Dan Harris. And so we wanted to share this interview here on the Meta Hour. Dan's a wonderful interviewer if you don't know him, and the 10% Happier podcast is fabulous. And so this is Dan interviewing Sharon instead of Sharon interviewing a guest. And it's all about the new book, which is quite different from Sharon's other books in that it's a full color illustrated gift book. It is kind of centered around some of her most popular quotes, as well as some quotes from other luminaries and little essays that are built around each of those. So it's the type of book that is perfect to open up and read at any page and walk away with something to pick you up, to illuminate, to clarify, to take with you in your day. And also it's different from Sharon's other books in that this is covering a lot of different topics. So instead of just being one theme, it's focusing on some of the real tenets of her teaching, beginning again, finding joy, working with the inner critic. And so we're excited to share this interview of Dan talking to Sharon all about the new book. To get yourself a copy of the new book, of course, you can visit SharonSalzberg.com. Before we get to today's interview, one announcement for you, which is that there is a in-depth course coming up that Sharon has put together that starts November 13th which is hosted by Tricycle Online. It is a course centered around her book, Real Life, which came out this spring. I know it's confusing to have two books come out in the same year, but this course is a six week course that is really a very deep dive into the teachings of the book, which are all about the movement from contraction and isolation to expansion and connection. And it's one of those courses that you can do at your own pace or within the six week parameter. It includes a couple of live Q and A's with Sharon. So if you're looking for something more in depth that is coming your way and you can visit our website to learn more. So without further ado, Dan Harris interviewing Sharon Salzberg on the 10% Happier podcast. Here we go. Sharon Salzberg, my friend, my teacher, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to see you. Congratulations on your new book. Thank you. It's a great thing to hear. There's another <laughs> book. <laughs> Oh, it's that joke about it's it, nobody likes writing a book, but we like having written them. So yes, publication day can be exciting. <laughs> or not, depending, yeah, on. depending on the case, depending on the book. Well, uh, speaking of your book, in your subtitle, you use some words that got my attention. and I, I wanted to maybe kick off this conversation there. The subtitle talks about, and these are your words, living an authentic life. What does that mean to you beyond the cliche of authenticity? Well, I wrote the book in the height of my isolation due to the pandemic. And so the question of an authentic life was very strong for me. You know, like everything I expected was not the case. I wasn't in New York. I was in Barry. I wasn't traveling. I wasn't teaching my normal schedule or anything approaching it. I wasn't teaching at all, except virtually. Life became virtual. And if I saw anybody, they were masked, they were distanced, and usually recording me for something else. But there were other things that were happening that were 
incredibly connected. You know, I felt really connected to the people I was teaching. People writing in the chats were so touching. They were so vulnerable about their situation and how lonely they were. And I felt internationally connected all at once. You know, I'd be teaching people in Abu Dhabi and New York and all these places. And so I, I really thought, what is an authentic life? And it's something about that connection and that connection feeling real and not authentic in the sense of, sometimes people use the word authentic to mean frank, even if you're horrible, like you have terrible views or you're nasty to people, but you're upfront about it. You don't pretend. But I'm not using authentic in that sense. You know, it's much more something deeper than our normal kind of frantic way of being. So there's something about, in your mind, authenticity is connected to some sort of connection or relationship to other people, whether it's virtual or not. Yeah, and also connected to ourselves. Like, there was certainly plenty of time to not be engaged in who's going to pick me up at the airport, where am I going to stay, and and simply be. And I made these resolves during that time, you know, there were certain things that never happened. Like I thought, I'm going to learn Spanish. I didn't learn a word. But I did resolve to be kinder. And that proved to be amazing because there are levels of kindness that are not inauthentic, as you well know. It's not pretense or hypocritical in any way, but it's out of reach because I'm just too busy and there's too much to do. And, and so to take the time, for example, my big resolve, one of my big resolves, during that time was not to press send at the end of an email, but to read it again and position myself in the seat of the recipient. I think, how would this sound? Because it's such a funny medium. It can be so terse and so easily misunderstood. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to read it again, read it all again, and edit it if that proves to be a good idea. And it often was a good idea. So I slowed down because of circumstance and I wasn't planning the next thing. And it was life. It's interesting for me, and I suspect for others who are familiar with you and your work, to hear you, of all people, the <laughs> pro most prominent Western proponent of loving kindness, to say that you had to resolve to be kinder. Well, I didn't have to. That, that was the delight of it. And I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And certainly my life transformed when I began doing loving kindness practice, though those many years ago in the 80s. And even before then, of course, when I began meditating at all. So it wasn't like I, I had a struggle to think of a value or, but I think for all of us, we can always go deeper and there are always refinements and there are always times left out. And I'm sorry I didn't learn Spanish. I wish I had, but this was really great. Let me go back to authenticity though, because it's one of these words that I feel it is used not by you, but by some people in very annoying ways. It feels hollow and cliched. And yet I think it's pointing to something incredibly important that I don't know that I can crystallize or articulate. So I'm kind of hoping to workshop it with you here. The other words that come up that seem to be in the same zone are like, I don't like this word either, but wholehearted or vulnerable or intimacy. The word I do like is kind of realness, but I don't know if I can f make this into a question per se, but I, what are your thoughts as I ramble here? I agree. I don't like any of those words either that much. But of course, I use them because that's what people understand. For Brene Brown to say vulnerability is strength was like a good twist on a word. But I think about you, for example, where I would imagine something happens in your own process so that a quality like loving kindness or compassion eventually did not seem a fabrication, something you were forced to pretend to feel, something that society was saying, perhaps this is good, and even if you don't feel it, act like you do, or whatever hesitation you had, and I think importantly add, about the terms and the ways it was being used. And something happened so that it was a genuine expression of who you are and what you care about, and maybe more genuine than just the habits that we all tend to have, you know? And so, as you know, one of my favorite questions to ask myself and to ask others is, who do we look at and who do we look through? We may be in the grocery store or, or shopping somewhere, and it's the same person that we tend to see time and time again, but we look right through them. We don't look at them. 
So what happens when we take the time to look at them? It's not forced, it's not coercion, it's not violent, but it takes intention to reach that place within us that is actually wanting to know what do I see, what happens when I don't look through people. And so something happened for all of us, each of us, and repeatedly happens so that these qualities, which could be cliched and gooky, are suddenly seen as parts of ourselves that were there, but not maybe accessed so much or not explored that much. And it feels like the most genuine way of being. It doesn't feel like artifice at all. Did it happen for you, Mr. Loving Kindness? Well, a couple of things. I want to answer that question. And I also want to put a pin in this notion of looking through people, because I, I want to come back to that, because I think that's worth its own separate strand. First to say, you use the word genuine, maybe that's the word. <laughs> it's a little less annoying than lots of the other ones that we've been tossing around. I guess the way I think about it, and, I, and I'm six years into writing a book about it and not, <laughs> not able to finish it, in part because this is one of the things I'm still working to articulate. One way to say it for me, in my experience, is everybody wins when I'm not an asshole. That's a glib way to put it. But it does speak to the fact that there is this interesting and non-individualistic process that can happen when you learn to be kinder to yourself and kinder to other people. That makes other people happier. It improves your relationships. And that in turn makes you happier. And so all the incentives then click into place. And that is more genuine than whatever habits you picked up from your parents or from the culture that might have blinded you to the possibilities and benefits of kindness. Mm -hmm. Does any of that make sense to you? It all makes sense. And I think in a way, when you said you didn't like those words and I said, I'm not really crazy about them either. That's what's extraordinary about being a writer. It's like, you get to say it, you know, and you get to struggle and you get to go deep inside and Look for how would you say it in a way that does resonate with you? And and it, everything you said resonates with me. And sometimes people call that greed. They say, my motive is really bad. I want a happier home life or I want a happier work life or, or whatever. And I say, well, that's not greed. That's science. That's saying, yeah, acts are consequential. And the way we speak is consequential. And we can change an environment. Because another interesting element I think about what you're describing is that's where learning takes place. And that's what we don't necessarily understand. I think we live, many of us, in a culture, either in families or communities or the culture at large, where it feels like if you're ashamed enough that you'll improve, you'll be better. And, and I think it's actually the opposite. As one psychologist once quoted to me, the brain filled with shame cannot learn. And so moving to the opposite states, not complacency or giving up, all values. It's not that at all, but it's having some compassion for yourself. It's realizing like, yeah, this is how life is. So many people ask me, how do I maintain mindfulness all day long at work? And I say, it's not going to happen. Or how do I keep the level of concentration I got on that retreat? I said, that's not going to happen either. But you can return to it. We come back and we come back and we come back and we learn to come back more gracefully and with less blame and more quickly. And that's really the whole thing. I agree with everything you just said, and in, in particular, this thing about shame. I sometimes call it psychic constipation, because you can't learn, you can't process much if you're stuck in self-laceration, which, by the way, is egotism. It is you with your head up your ass. You're just totally in your own story. For me, what's been really helpful is this term that my friend Dolly Chug, who's been on the show a couple of times, came up with, which is goodish. If you think of yourself as a goodish person, well, then it's not a huge shock when somebody points out you've been an asshole. You don't have to take it all the way to being a direct affront at this assumption you've been carrying around that you're perfect. And you don't have to go into a death spiral around the fact that you're irredeemably rotten. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm goodish, but I can always improve. And that's where taking the shame out of the equation gets, for me, mm -hmm, super mm -hmm. useful. Mm -hmm. So maybe we like the term vulnerability after all, because that would allow <laughs> for expressing those things or understanding those things and not being ashamed of them. Yeah, well, I certainly like the concept. I don't know if I like the term, but there's, I think there's something incredibly powerful here. And it does bring me back to genuineness and this phrase that I often talk about and think about 
or at least this is my understanding from Tibetan, the word for enlightenment is a clearing away and a bringing forth. And so if you can clear away all the habit patterns, if you can clear away all of the gunk and the noise, what's actually below it all, which comports with how we were designed or wired or how we evolved as a species, mm -hmm. is what the psychological researchers might call pro-sociality. Mm -hmm. Well, in some schools of Tibetan Buddhism, the word for meditation, which in Theravadan Buddhism, in southern schools, would be cultivation, like cultivating the ground so that certain things can emerge. The term in Tibetan Buddhism in those schools is getting familiar with it or getting used to it. And so that, of course, brings up the question, like, what's it? And what's it is a belief that as human beings having an ordinary human life, every one of us has pretty well had some moments of incredible clarity or connection or love or peace or joy, but we're not awfully used to it. We don't live there. I and mean, even sometimes tremendous suffering can bring us there because everything else falls away. Uh, art brings us there. So many things bring us there. Human love, but we don't dwell there. We don't abide there. And so maybe we have a moment and we think, what was that? Or I want that back or I never want to go there again or whatever. I think I'll tell everyone about that. I won't tell anyone about that. But we don't know how to live there. And so meditation is not moving from nowhere, nothing, being defective, being in a deficit to somewhere. It's You've had those moments. That is part of who you are. But they're so infrequent. They're so fleeting that now we're going to learn how to abide in the deepest places we have already known. Mm. So it was like that because, you know, uh, even cultivate gets that sense somewhat because it's like if you're cultivating a garden, you need to be somewhat patient and not grabby and also not in that acquisitive mode. If I get a big insight before noon, I never have to meditate again or <laughs> something like that. So I'm just cultivating the ground. I'm creating the conditions for what I want to emerge. I need to put that on a piece of paper and write it down before my next meditation retreat where I do a lot of suffering around trying to get somewhere. <sighs> I'll tell you my favorite word, actually. Let's go back to words. My favorite word used to be poignant because I was trying to describe the feeling tone of compassion, which is not giddy with joy. You know, it's got that sort of tug. Would that I were able to rid you of all suffering. I would in a moment and I'm not able. But now my favorite word is emergent seeing that all these things, insight, love, connection, they're like emergent properties out of how we pay attention. So since you're still writing and I'm done, <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome to those words. Say more. So how we pay attention can lead to the emergence of love or mindfulness. Yeah. Let's go back to the grocery store clerk that you look through. And it's not that you're intrusive or nosy and you say, tell me about your joys and sorrows necessarily at all. But if you look at them, there's something that happens. There's a kind of resonance. And the stories could be very different, but they're there. Or all the times that we are stuck with an agenda in our heads and we're not really listening to somebody, not even a stranger, a close family member, but we're just in that loop of, I've got to convince them of this, or it's got to be my way, or something like that. When we can step out of that and actually pay attention, and listen, then communication can happen. So I think quite a bit depends on how we pay attention. It also solves the big problem that people have, I think, with the idea that qualities like love or compassion can be trainable, which is a big problem for a lot of people. But it's not trainable in a cold or mechanical sense. It's more like um, if there are emergent properties of how we pay attention, we know attention is trainable because that's exactly what meditation practice is. How do we pay attention? Who do we pay attention to? What do we pay attention to? Is it only the negative, for example? Or can we take it a broader picture of life? If we accept that meditation or anything, really many things, can train attention to be different, then we have a formula, we have a foundation for actually being able to train these qualities. I'm thinking about this notion of looking at people you normally look through and I reflect with some, I don't want to say shame, but some embarrassment 
or as our mutual friend Koshin Paley Ellison talks about the notion of healthy embarrassment, like looking at your past fuck ups with some sense of humor. So I, I look back with some, and I don't have to look too far back, with some healthy embarrassment at my tendency at times to be diffident, arrogant, cold, removed in my own head, especially with people who were junior to me on the hierarchical scale or my wife used to point out that I often wouldn't say hello to the doorman when we lived in the city in an apartment building and how over time really training the muscle to notice when I'm <laughs> going to look away and really deliberately, not in a big showy way, but just to look at people, say a quick word. It doesn't take a bunch of time, but it really changes the texture and flavor of the whole day when I can remember to do it. Does that all sound like familiar mm -hmm. to you? Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. So it's like loving kindness training in real time, you know, in person. In your new book, you talk about having a healthy relationship, not only with other people, but also with yourself. There's a passage about being your own BFF. What is that all about? In the classical tradition, when we do loving kindness practice, we start with ourselves, which I just thought it was a little odd. The idea that's not selfish, it's not self-preoccupied, it's not self-centered. But it really is like a kind of foundational exercise. And I don't mean one, like sometimes people say, I'm going to do loving kindness only for myself. And I'm not sure that's perfect either because then it becomes like a project. And how do you know when you're done? What's enough? So you can think about someone else, like your poor doorman who's been standing there in the cold. There's some balance there. But oddly enough, for many of us in our time, in our culture, we are hard to offer loving kindness to ourselves. They say they start in the classical practice with yourself because the underlying principle of that practice is doing it in the easiest way possible. So I'm meant to be a struggle. It's creative. It's fun. It's interesting. And so you start with yourself because clearly you are easier than anybody. That's produced a lot of laughs over the years. Because it's not so for many of us that we're not the easiest of all. And so I always encourage people to switch up the order. Go back to the principle. Maybe you start with your puppy or your cat or your teacher, somebody that you love in a, an easier kind of way. And they would say your parent, but that also could be complicated. And start there and bring yourself in later. It's fine. But do bring yourself in. It's like you can't leave yourself out altogether. And that's the idea is that we're building on this emergence and allowing things to unfold in an easier way and discovering capacities inside of ourselves that are covered over, perhaps, or hidden from viewer that we don't really trust that much. And we learn to trust them more. And so that's the nature of the practice. And so when we say be your own, or I say be your own BFF, it's a fun way of saying, don't shrink away from that. That's not wrong. That's not selfish. And at the same time, it's not a project. It's not pass-fail. We just are working in the way that we're working. And it is inextricably interwoven with how you treat other people and therefore how you feel about yourself. It isn't just an isolated project. Yeah, yeah. And it goes back and forth. I mean, you know, people often say, you can't really love somebody until you love yourself. And I think that may be in the most genuine, refined sense of love. But I and we probably know plenty of people who are devoted to caring for others and truly caring for them. And they're not included themselves in that package. And, and that's it's unsustainable is what it is. I think it could be a, a very pure kind of love and compassion for a little while but it's just unsustainable. We, we get exhausted. What about the beef that some people have, some of our mutual friends have, that self-love is kind of like anti-Buddhist in a way because the whole practice is about seeing that the self is an illusion. People have that beef, I know. <laughs> um, my first book was called Loving Kindness. It came out in 1995. And I heard that a fair amount. This is a practice that you will not see the emptiness of things. You'll just be feeling good. People will get attached to good feeling, which isn't necessarily the case, depending on one's understanding. And it's true. It's not a practice that's designed to deepen particularly one's understanding of emptiness. It is a practice that's about being less afraid. 
feeling more connected, seeing more clearly in a sense of understanding kind of the interdependence of life, that sense of self and other and us and them is a construct because we'd start to dwell more in the realm of we rather than you, you know, over there and me way over here. It it just, things shift, but I did hear that critique a lot. And at the same time, I was coming upon people, like I had been practicing mindfulness for about 14 or 15 years when I went to Burma and did intensive loving kindness training. And then my whole practice for about four years was just loving kindness. I had wanted to learn loving kindness from the day I started meditating, which was January 7th, 1971, but I didn't have anyone to teach me. And I tried on my own and I learned how it was done, but it didn't really work until I went to Burma and did this intensive retreat for three months to start with. I understood what it had given me and tools I had already through the mindfulness practice that were great. And yet the benefit I was accruing from doing this particular practice. And so it took me a long time to write the book. Anyway, I was teaching Loving Kindness for probably 10 years before I wrote the book. And then the book came out and then I kept writing it to people who'd say to me, you know, I've been practicing a long time and I didn't realize because this is the context in which I practice. We chant about this, about serving all beings. We have rituals about it. We have scripture about it, but I actually didn't know how to train or embellish or enhance that quality in myself. And here it is. And it's not mine. I was just taking what I learned and putting it in book form and putting it out there. And I'm so glad that I did. And there was that commentary. Yes, you could say it's not going to help you necessarily understand the truth of emptiness, but if emptiness is the truth, Anything we do that brings us closer to the truth, including serving a meal to an elderly person and listening to them, having a conversation with them, anything we do that brings us closer to the truth is going to bring us closer to that. Also, emptiness doesn't mean hollowness, to use your word. You know, it's not void or blank. It means contingency. It actually means interconnection. There's that angle in which we are actually enhancing that understanding. And I say practice is all of life, and life is practice. And so, It's going to have different emphasis and different methodologies at different times. And you could also say that there are two different levels. There's the absolute level, in which case you're using words like you, may you be happy, that don't make sense. But the Buddha also spoke in terms of relative truth. He didn't say, you psychophysical bundle of aggregates over there, sit here. Or he said, you, Momok, sit here. We just use relative language because we're normal human beings, and so is he, actually, in some way. And it's fine to have different levels going at different times. Let me see if I can, just like any good FM DJ, go back and back announce some of the tracks that were just played there. I just want to make sure that people listening understand some of the key terms you were using. So let me try to see if I can define them, and then you, as my teacher, can correct me where I go wrong. Emptiness, we could do a whole series of podcasts on emptiness, but one way to understand it is that the world may look solid to you, may look like reality is one continuous movie, but like any film, it's actually 24 frames per second. Nothing is as solid as it seems, including you. If you look for Sharon between your ears, if you close your eyes and try to find Sharon in your mind, you won't find some core nugget of Sharon. On some relative level, there is a Sharon. Of course, if Sharon looks in the mirror, she will see her reflection. And so, yes, on the level of consensual reality, Sharon exists. But on the ultimate level, and in Buddhism, we often talk about two levels of reality. On the ultimate level, there is no core nugget of Sharon you can find. Just as this chair I'm sitting in right now, I can all recognize it as a chair. But if we put a high-powered microscope on it, we'd see it's mostly empty space and spinning subatomic particles. And two things can be true at the same time. And you were saying before that, yes, there is this critique of loving kindness, that it's really on the relative level, on the more superficial level of reality. You're not seeing the true emptiness of things. But if, in fact, seeing interconnection, which does happen, I believe, inexorably through loving kindness practice, that Mm -hmm, you see mm -hmm. that your life has something to do with the lives of the people around you, 
doesn't that, as you indicated, just lead you straight toward emptiness anyway? Yeah, that's great. I, mean, I would say the core idea. Yeah, I would add a few adjectives. It's like core of Sharon or Dan that is unchanging, that is solid, that is independent of causes and conditions, you know, that's in charge. If they were like a little core inside, shouldn't it be pulling the strings like a puppet show? Shouldn't it be able to say, well, I'm not going to die? That doesn't mean there's nothing we can do in terms of extending our life, but that idea, I'm never going to be afraid again. I've decided. It doesn't seem to be a little empowered core in there that can make things happen just according to will or wish. And so uh, that was just an add-on to, I think, a very fine description, truly, of what emptiness is. That's what I meant by, you had used the word hollow before. And so it's not hollow. It's not like everything dissolves and nothing will exist. Everything exists as it exists, but how does it exist right now? If we really pay attention, there's constant change and there's no single, solid, independent, in charge, little secret ingredient in there. There's just not. And it would be a different world, actually, if there were, perhaps. And I'm not sure relative is more superficial. It's different. It's how things work. The more ultimate level would be dealing very directly with this idea of that solid, impermeable, unchanging, independent self, which is just not there. And what's our experience when that misconception dissolves and we see things more the way that they are? Then we do see interconnection and because everything's still happening. It's not like the world disappears. And it's all happening because of cause and effect, because actions have consequences, because love will produce a certain energy, a certain result in a room, in a family, within ourselves. Hatred and perpetual hatred and chronic hatred will produce a different kind of energy and a different atmosphere, and it's a different place to work. That's what's going around all the time. And so that's the relative. It's what we face all the time as we look at how things are connected. Coming up, Sharon talks about the line between love and attachment, the challenge of uh, receiving other people's generosity, and the particular issue she is personally working on in her own practice. Here's another question that I often hear, and I'm sure you hear it all the time, when it comes to the connection between, or the relationship between love and Buddhism. In Buddhism, as you know, there's a lot of focus on seeing emptiness, seeing that everything's changing all the time, and therefore there is no core, solid, independent Sharon or Dan, and that the one of the only sensible ways to relate to all of this is to not be attached. If I cling too hard to things that will not last, I am bound to suffer. How do I love somebody without being attached to them? Well, it's a little more complicated nowadays because of Western schools of psychology around attachment theory and secure attachment and all that. It doesn't, I think, mean quite the same thing. I think, just not to say it's going to be easy anyway, but when I try to understand attachment as a concept, sometimes I substitute the word control, and that helps make sense. So that's actually not love. That's a different thing. And love, if you call love wishing for the happiness and well-being of the other, then that's something we can have even towards somebody whose behavior we think is really bad, and and we want to help prevent in some way. Uh, So it's not passive, and it doesn't mean you're not trying to create change at all. But that's like a more like a motivating factor. Are you saying what you're saying or holding back from saying anything at all because of care or because of connection or because of fear? Are you saying what you're saying or doing what you're doing or trying to make the change that you're seeking out of compassion for yourself or for all, for even the person acting, or is it really hatred? And so we pay attention to what's motivating us, I think, more than anything. And you come to understand that, yeah, I can take very strong action, but it doesn't have to be rooted or born out of those old habits of of being. And, And so the world kind of opens up in terms of what we might do. Like people often say, well, I don't know about developing a more loving heart or developing compassion because then I can only say yes. I can only let them move back in. I can only lend them more money. 
And it's not like that. We might act in any way, not meek or sweet and all that. So when I think of attachment, I often think of, I don't have any children, and yet I know certainly have great friends who have children and grandchildren, and the distinction that that parent or grandparent even has to make between wanting the happiness of the child, wanting them to be fulfilled, wanting their well-being, and wanting them to be a certain way, even with some duress to oneself, letting go. Like I have a friend who's a grandparent who she would describe herself and does quite publicly as having a very nervous, like anxious constitution. She's just kind of wired that way and has done a lot of work. But I remember one of her grandsons at one point said to her that when he grew up, he wanted to be a police officer, which for her was like the kiss of death. And he ended up not doing that. But I watched her process, you know, where she like gulped and knew that it would be wrong to say, I have a very different vision for you and you should be a rabbi or whatever, something nice, safe and out of love for him, she couldn't do that and say, you can't do that. It'll drive me crazy. I won't sleep. And there was a kind of letting go there that was very beautiful and, and ended up not turning out quite that way anyway. And so she can hopefully sleep at night. I'm sure that every parent, everyone who loves someone deeply in that way has a lot of letting go involved, letting go of attachment and needing to be in control. My son is in the regrettable habit right now of wearing fake gold chains to school and um, doing a lot of letting go around um, letting him make his own sartorial decisions as <laughs> catastrophic as I might feel them to be. Having said that, let me just take it to a darker place. What about when you lose somebody that you really love? Do you mourn? Yeah, of course. That I think that's a question a lot of people have. Yeah, I think you mourn during the height of the pandemic when I was teaching so much and apparently saying some of the same things over and over again. People got to making me cups and sending them to me with some of those sayings. Like this one says, banging your head against the wall is never fun, which apparently I said a good deal. And one of them was, some things just hurt. Some things are hurt. They're hurtful. They're horrible. They're not because you have the wrong attitude, not because you need more equanimity, not because your thinking is askew. Some things just hurt. There are terrible things to live through. And what we don't need is extra suffering. That's different than the idea that I should be in some sublime state about this. Because the extra suffering would be like, we feel the pain and we add a kind of misconstrued sense of isolation. I'm the only one who has ever felt or will ever feel this kind of pain, or this is blameworthy. I should have said, or they should have done. And we more see things in the light of wisdom, and yet they hurt. They say the Buddha, when his two chief disciples died within, I think, two weeks of one another, he said at one point in a discourse, it's like the sun and the moon have left the sky. So he wasn't saying like, I'm really cool. I got this. People die. It's the nature of things. But one senses he knew people die. And that, that kind of protestation of life should not include that. That didn't have to be there. That's extra. Life does include that. On top of that, we have very strange cultural accretions around death and dying. And so not only do we have the existential pain of it all, but we have whatever we've inherited. And so there's a lot of challenge. And I would say I was coming to a state of pure mourning in that bereavement. There are a couple of analogies that sometimes get used here that might be helpful illuminating things. One, this is a little bit more uh, tongue-in-cheek, but I heard this from a mutual friend of ours, Dr. Mark Epstein, when I was asking, what was it like for the Buddha when he lost a friend or stubbed a toe or whatever, dealt with the same traumas and indignities that we all deal with? And he said he imagined that it would be like getting punched in the face, but after having received a dose of heroin, that it would still hurt, but might hurt significantly less. That is not an endorsement of heroin. The other analogy that's a little bit more fit for public consumption is, and this is easier to see rather than to hear, but if you imagine your palm with an open fist, you can put anybody you love there and you're holding them, but you're not grasping them as opposed to when you clench your fist. Mm -hmm. 
So I can love my son and know that like everything else in the universe, he's temporary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a reflection people do. He's temporary for sure, because that's the nature of life. And just notice that doesn't diminish the love. If anything, if we have that kind of consciousness, it should make it more piercing in a way. Yeah. Poignant even. Yeah. Bring it back to that. <laughs> Last thing I want to ask you about from your book is the difficulty many of us have in receiving generosity. Can you describe that phenomenon? And I'd be curious whether it's true for you. I say it's true for me, but not as true as I've observed in some other people. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> my big model for that was actually Ramdas who was at my first retreat in January 1971 as a student. He'd already been to India and was Ram Dass, not Richard Alpert. He'd already been fired from Harvard. He'd come back to India to see his guru. And I'd known him for a really long time, and we were good friends and this group of us. And, and he was the kind of person, he was a helper, he was a giver. He was the first person I knew working with dying people. He was the first person I knew working with prisoners. He was the first person I knew working with homeless people and kept taking his spiritual practice out into the world. And he was also he was a curmudgeon, and you couldn't thank him for anything. You couldn't even give him a birthday present. It was just his way. And, and then, you know, of course, he had this massive stroke and lived in a wheelchair for the last, I don't know, 15, 18 years of his life as a public speaker, which had really been his magic. And, you know, he had aphasia. It would be long silences and... If you were speaking with him and you'd be sitting up on that stage and you knew just what he wanted to say and you couldn't say it because you knew he had to find the word himself. And he said once he was teaching, he said, the hardest thing of all with the stroke, harder than physical pain, harder than living in a wheelchair, harder than all this change in, in speech has been being able to receive. He said it was the hardest thing of all and it was the most liberating. Hmm. And he said, one of my famous books was called, How Can I Help? And he said, now I feel like writing a book called, How Can You Help Me? And it was true. It was like toward the end of his life, post-stroke, it was like some boundary dissolved. And so it's like love could come in and come out. And I felt it, certainly. It was like he was made of light. He was made of love. He was just transparent. And that was the change. It was actually being able to, he had to receive or he, that would have been a call for bitterness forever. And so it was amazing to sort of watch that. So I feel like, yes, you know, I'm, I'm much more comfortable giving than receiving, but then I've got him as a model. He was worse, you know? <laughs> so I know so many people like that, but it's the caregivers, the, the helpers, and it's a very powerful thing to pay attention to. But I'm, I remind myself that receiving is also a practice. And what is the mechanism by which receiving, how exactly is receiving generosity a good spiritual practice? Can you just explain the blocking and tackling on that? Well, I mean, I think everything, again, comes down to paying attention. It's like noticing how it feels when somebody says, I loved your book. It probably feels really good. But there might be some part in there that's saying, I wish I had more time and I, I might have, I would have done it even better. And noticing it all, just keep paying attention. What does it feel like to feel the appreciation and let it in? Or here's one. The book that's coming out is my 13th book. And with my 12th book, which also came out this year, I've been so incredibly grateful when anyone has said that it meant a lot to them. And they thought it was really good because I thought it's so easy to imagine your 12th book. It's like... People saying she should have stopped at number eight. Like, <laughs> she's saying the same thing over and over again. There's not that much to say. It's all like a body of knowledge. So I've felt incredibly grateful. But I can imagine falling into the space, which I have not. Like, number 13, will there ever be a 14? I have nothing left to say ever. I might have that thought, but I know it's just a thought. But to fall into that and think, I'm done, I can't do it, it's all over, it would also be easy, and you, you don't want that. But should that happen... Just keep paying attention. What does it feel like to have that sense of hopelessness? I'm done. What does it feel like to think, well, if something inspires me, I'm just going to write. It doesn't have to be for publication. I'm going to see where it goes. What does it feel like to determine on 
bringing creativity into your everyday some way? What does it feel like when someone doesn't like your book? And just always pay attention to that. That's really using it as a practice because you begin to see, you just begin to see the nuance. Here is a place I felt like I needed to be in control and I couldn't control. I mean, that's the thing about public presentation of creativity, right? You can't demand that everybody likes it. This is what it feels like to not be in control. This is what it feels like to remember to thank somebody and not take it for granted because it could have been another way. And we just keep paying attention and paying attention. We have interest, we have curiosity, rather than judgment about what we discover within ourselves. And that becomes the basis for really using all of these experiences as part of our practice. Final question for me, and I've asked you this question on other occasions, but I'm I'm always curious to hear answers from people in your position who've been practicing for a long time. What is the edge in your practice right now? What is the thing you're working on the most or you struggle with the most low these many years of, of, of practice? I wouldn't use the word struggle. It doesn't feel that way. I feel like I'm on the edge often between, I have a number of practices that are just open and spacious and not particularly particular. And then I have a number of practices like loving kindness, which is very specific and it's got a lot of form to it and structure and moving between the two is an interesting edge for me. I spent a long time in life just doing loving kindness practice. I spent a long time after that doing basically mindfulness practice, especially open, spacious awareness when I sit every day. And I would do loving kindness practice. My resolve was to do it whenever I was waiting. And I counted every mode of transportation as waiting. So walking down the streets of New York, certainly waiting in a waiting room somewhere, every airplane, every taxi, I would do loving kindness practice silently, eyes open, and then I stopped going anywhere (laughs) more recently. And so thinking, do I go back to doing loving kindness practice in that formal way, very structured as part of my formal practice or not? It's just an interesting dance that I do. So the balance between structured and unstructured practice, by which I think you're referring to unstructured stuff that you would do in your free range living and structured as a formal seated practice. Yeah, 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 it's fun. How do you resolve that? I think my current resolution is to go back and do more loving kindness practice in a strict seated way in the sequence in which I was taught using the phrases even that I was taught that are a little different than the ones we use, maybe even use them in poly, and just see what happens when I recreate that, that kind of commitment and structure. Is there something I should have asked you today that I failed (laughs) to ask you? No. (laughs) I hope your book on loving kindness goes well, and (laughs) that I get to read it soon, and I'm sure it will help many people, but I hope it's a source of a lot of joy for you. Thank you. I'm trying. I'm actually, I think an edge in my practice in life is giving myself permission to let the book take what it's going to take, not rush it, and even try to enjoy the process, which would be a real novelty for me. And yes, that is a thing I'm working on. Occasional starbursts of promise on that front. It's certainly not a nonstop parade of joy. Before I let you go, can you please plug your new book and any of the preceding books or any other resources that you're putting out in the world that you want people to know about? Sure. The two books that both have yellow covers, very different, of 2023. The book that came out in April is called Real Life. That was book number 12. And I like that one a lot. It's about what life is like when we're feeling most contracted, most trapped, and what it's like when we open and feel more expansive and what we take with us on that journey, what we can leave behind, things like that. And so this current book is the first time I've had an illustrated book. It's a little gift book. And that was a really fascinating process. That's called Finding Your Way. And it was more suited to the way I think and write, which is unstructured. Instead of having to have a theme throughout, which is more difficult for me, it would be like I hear a quote from Maya Angelou is one example. When we know better, we do better. And that reminds me of one of my colleagues often saying, everyone's just doing the best that they can. 
And I would always sit there and listen and think, I don't know about that. Like, I'm a New Yorker. What do you mean? Everyone's doing the best that they can. But of course, they're saying the same thing. And my evolution in understanding that. So it might be a quote and a commentary or something somebody said that resonated with me or a short essay that I wrote about something. And so it's like lots of small pieces, very suited to our time and our attention span, I think. And then it was just so cool to be illustrated in those ways as well. So I really appreciate this forthcoming book as well. I think it is really suited to how we learn these days and how we take in things. And yeah, they both have yellow covers. As I said, it's my yellow period. (laughs) Well, congratulations. And thank you you for this book, the preceding book and all the preceding books. Thanks you for all of your teaching. Thanks for being such a great friend. Uh, And thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you so much. Hey, folks. Thanks so much for listening. If you'd like to learn more about the 10% Happier podcast or app, you can visit 10percent.com. That's T-E-N-P-E-R-S-E-N-T.com. And for any of Sharon's ongoing teachings, online courses, or books, you can visit her website at SharonSalzberg.com. This has been the Meta Hour podcast from the Be Here Now Network. May you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, and may you live with ease. <laughs>